I'm going to uh, now move to another panelist that we have, Alexandrine Palot de Cabion. Apologies if I've said your name wrongly, but uh, Alex is the Director of Strategy at Privacy International. She manages and oversees the development and delivery of Privacy International's strategic portfolio aimed at ensuring that innovative solutions serve individuals and communities and protection of their dignity rather than state and corporate interests. Previously, she was engaged in research and advocacy on issues relating to human rights, irregular immigration, security sector reform, gender, conflict, uh, and human security. She holds a Master of Science in Conflict, Security and Development, following her LLM in International Law and her Bachelor of Arts in Law with International Relations. Alexandria, if you could, Alexandrian, I beg your pardon, if you could begin by uh, helping us to understand accountability uh, and how data controllers and processors should implement it. Of course, uh, thank you, Gabriel, for, for the introduction. And also thank you for, uh, well, to Unwanted Witness for inviting us to, to join this important discussion today. Um, at least me personally, after years of working with Unwanted Witness and other stakeholders in Uganda, um, advocating for a strong data protection law um, for, for Uganda, it, it's great to be here and, and to have this discussion. Um, which is really important if the law that we've been you know, advocating for and that we finally have is to deliver on its objectives, which is to protect people and their rights. Um, and which is why before starting to talk about accountability, I wanted to remind uh, ourselves and the audience um, around why, why data protection matters and um, why we were advocating for, for this law. And, and really the, the fundamentals around data protection which we need to keep at the back of our minds constantly is that it's about safeguarding fundamental right to privacy by regulating the processing of, of personal data, by providing the individuals with rights um, and control over their data. But importantly, which is the focus of today's discussion, it's about setting up a system of accountability and clear obligations uh, for those who um, either control or undertake the processing of, of that data. And that requires setting up and ensuring there is elements of uh, and obligations around enforcement, as well as redress uh, when these principles, the rights and obligation are not adhered to uh, by these different um, actors. And then as well, I wanted to mention like beyond um, the element around um, protecting the right to privacy, data protection is also a key part of the puzzle to protect other fundamental rights. And um, Alan uh, mentioned this in, in his introduction, the way personal data is processed today by both public and private actors has significant uh, implication on many aspects of our lives from accessing public benefits such as healthcare to social protection, as well as to issues around economic opportunities such as employment, recruitment, or the ability to secure a loan, as well as um, issues that Unwanted Witness has been addressing as part of the um, elections, uh, which is our ability to engage um, in democratic processes as well. So I want us to really remind ourselves as to what is the purpose here of data protection, because there's a tendency only to focus on the compliance aspects, which will be a lot of the discussion today. Um, and then the second thing I think to, to I wanted to remind the audience about is um, who does the law uh, apply to? And here it's really important to remember that it applies both to public authorities, but also private entities. Um, and just because we're going to use a lot of uh, legal jargon, and I'll try and do, and do so as little as possible, um, we're going to be using terms such as data controller or data processor. Um, and I wanted to remind uh, the audience what, what these different actors are and what their roles are um, within the data protection regime. So the data controller will be the entity who decides the purposes and the means of processing of that personal data, which will be the, the why and the how the data um, is processed, whilst the data processor, um, in a way, will be the one 
performing the processing of the personal data on behalf of the controller, and they might be the ones that manage the methods and the means um, of processing. So um, I just wanted to give that quick introduction before we go, if, before I go into the discussion on accountability. Um, when it comes to accountability, uh, this is a core data protection principle. And, and what it does is that it makes data controllers and processors responsible um, for complying with the law by requiring them to demonstrate the steps they've taken um, to comply uh, with the data protection principles um, that are in the law to facilitate and fulfill the exercise of these rights by individuals whose um, data is being processed, um, as well as to abide by any other laws um, enshrined um, by those principles. And a key element here to, to reflect on as well is that over the years, the principle of accountability has evolved, um, really putting the burden on data processes and controllers to prove how they fulfill those obligations. Um, and so I'm repeating myself a little bit here, but to summarize, there are two elements around accountability. Um, the first one is being clear as to who's responsible within that relationship of the data processing activity, be it the data controller or their data processor. And then once that responsibility has been assigned to one or both parties, um, it's to for each of them uh, to demonstrate how they comply. So those are the two elements, assigning responsibility and demonstrating uh, compliance. Um, and what this means really is that we're the law is asking those that process personal data to be more open and proactive um, about the way that they handle data um, in relation to their obligations under the law. They must be able to um, explain their processing activities, show how they're undertaking them, and prove that they're taking measures uh, to protect people's privacy. Um, and this element is both in relation to individuals, so that individuals um, can have guarantees um, that their rights are being considered um, and are informing the processing activities of data controllers and processes, but also in the relations with the regulator, which in the case of Uganda uh, was set up by section four uh, of the Data Protection and Privacy Act of 2019 as a data protection office um, within, um, within NITA, uh, Uganda. And so when we're talking about accountability, what this means um, in practice, and I'll go through three different components here um, of uh, what is required uh, of data controllers and processors. Um, the first one is there are various technical and organizational measures that data controllers and processors should take um, and demonstrate compliance um, with the law. Uh, this is not an exhaustive list, but I'll try and cover as many um, as possible. The first one is you know, something that Alan referred to, which is around privacy notices and data protection policies. Um, both data controllers and processors must be um, must have a privacy policy, which is accessible and importantly user friendly, which provides information to individuals to know how their personal data is being processed, by whom, uh, for what reason, so the legal basis uh, for that, as which will also explain why um, and you know who it's being shared with, again, for what purposes, how long will it be stored for, and it should also give information to individuals about their rights um, and the control that they have over those processing activities. The second one is around recording processing activities. Um, so one of the things that particularly in order to comply um, with elements of transparency and accountability and allowing individuals to exercise their rights, um, data controls and processors need to be keeping a record of their processing activities in writing. And this um, will form the basis of information that they might have they have to provide to individuals at the moment of starting the processing, but also should an individual then request what information is being held about them by a particular entity, this is the process and the information that would be provided to them. Another element is that um, data controls and processes as part of their accountability uh, and their obligations um, need to have a duty and responsibility to safeguard the security of the data as well as the infrastructure. And here we often forget the second component. It's not just about ensuring that the data um, is protected as 
per the obligations um, and the data protection principles, uh, but also it's protecting the data that it, and the infrastructure itself at every stage of um, the processing from the collection, generation, retention and sharing. And this will apply to both the data at rest as well as the data um, in transit. Another element that to build into that, that data controllers uh, and processes must take into account um, and consider, particularly at the planning stage, and this is really important, some of these discussions need to happen very early on before even the processing of the personal data happens. And this is linked to what's called privacy by design and by default, whereby technical decisions can be made in the design stage of the system. And they can play a strong role uh, in putting data protection rules into practice. Um, this also helps to put the burden on the data controller and the processor rather than on the individual. And so by privacy by design, this is about integrating privacy from the onset and privacy by default, which means that again, around the burden, the burden is on the data controller and processor to um, have those protections by default without requiring a user to change the settings that are put there by default. Another key element here is around um, integrating um, impact assessment. So again, this is something that has to be done prior to the processing of personal data. And it's about um, assessing the risks um, that might emerge from the processing and what are the mitigation strategies that should be um, implemented. A key element of accountability is also about oversight. Um, and so each um, data controller processor should be designating internally um, a data protection officer to oversee um, and regulate the implementation of the law. Um, key, other key elements would be around um, notification of breach. So if something goes wrong and there's a breach of um, individual's personal data, um, that then uh, an individual as well as the regulator, in this case, the data protection office within NITA would then um, be informed. And so these obligations that I've mentioned are a way for data processes and controllers to demonstrate that they're taking proactive steps to comply with the law and to protect people's personal data. And this is not a one-off um, element. It has to be done continuously and continuously be reviewed because there could be internal or external factors um, which might influence the decisions that are being made. The second part before I conclude, I just want to mention two elements here when it comes to accountability. It's also about providing mechanisms for individuals, not only to get guarantees that their rights and their data are being protected, as, as I just outlined, but also to have mechanisms that they can exercise their rights. Um, and here, an example I wanted to mention is um, the one related, for example, to the right to um, access information. This would also mean that a data controller and processor um, may have to have a mechanism in place um, to be able to provide information to an individuals to tell them um, with guarantees and certainty what data was um, processed about them, how it was used, who it was shared with, um, et cetera. And so that's an important one. And the second part I wanted to mention was around the powers of the regulator. Um, so in addition to individuals being able to exercise their rights directly, with a data controller, there's also powers that the regulators will have um, to conduct investigations, to act on complaints, and the work, for example, that Unwanted Witness did last year and earlier this year around um, the motorcycle ride-sharing app Safe Boda really highlighted the opportunities that come with such an accountability mechanism, because what resulted from the evidence that they provided about the failures of the Safe Boda um, app was that the regulator ended up taking enforcement action requiring the company um, to really rethink how and change how they were handling people's personal data in order to comply with the data, the, the act of 2019. And these are things that at Privacy International we've utilized quite widely to hold public and private entities to account by requesting regulators to investigate either the activities of a particular company, of a right. data broker. And so to conclude, um, I think the key message that I, I want everyone to take away is really to see accountability not only as a compliance issue, um, but also in terms of why it matters. And the reason why it matters is that 
obviously we're super happy that there's a law and it was a long process and we're happy we got there, but this is only the beginning. The law is the starting point and now we need to use it and enforce it um, because protecting people and their rights is dependent on the effective informants and, and compliance. And that requires monitoring and assessing how data controllers and processors are implementing that. And the, the last point I wanted to make is this is really very much about trust. By being open and transparent about their process activities and by being proactive and organized about complying with their obligations that will mean that data controllers and processes will indicate their approach to data protection as well as their commitment to protecting people and both from public and private entities this will influence and inform the relationships that we might have with those entities whether we trust them with our information um, and whether we might raise concerns and want to exercise our rights um, so that's one i want to to mention to to start off the discussion this afternoon thank you thank you very much trust is key and i like alex that you started by saying you know there can be a lot of jargon here legal jargon and uh in your whole submission you actually avoided the legal jargon so thank you very much you talked about the policies being accessible and uh, easy for people to follow i wonder if these policies uh, like your presentation actually put it in plain simple language for people to be able to follow maybe we will hear uh, as we go further on in the discussion you did mention uh, the uh, the data collector and now we're going to hear uh, more in depth on the role of data collectors. Uh, Varun Bashakala is the one going to do uh, this in-depth, you know, give us an in-depth understanding of the role of a data collector. But just before he comes, I'd like to uh, tell you about what he's done uh, so you understand the person that's giving this presentation. So Varun is a data scientist at the Tactical Technology Collective. It's a Berlin-based NGO that works globally at the intersection of activism and technology. For the past year, he has been studying how personal data is becoming a political asset, influencing elections and referenda. His team has partnered with researchers and journalists in over a dozen countries in the process. Previously, he worked as a data scientist at Wealthfront, where he managed experiments across the company and at Dropbox, where he helped preempt cyber attacks and supported the launch of a new office. He was also a fellow of the inaugural Eric and Wendy Schmidt Data Scientists for Social Good Fellowship. He received his bachelor's degree in statistics and economics from uh, Yale University and studied abroad at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's invite uh, Varun, who will be talking about the role of data collectors in data protection and privacy policy implementation. Over to you, Varun. Thank you so much. I hope you can hear me all right. Um, yes. Good morning from New York City, where I am at the moment. Gabriel, thank you for the introduction. And to Unwanted Witness, thank you so much for the invitation to come speak here today. I would love to share my screen, um, but maybe in the moment while that permission is um, being granted to me, assuming that's possible. Um, I just want to um, echo what Alexandrine just said right now about the role of um, safeguarding fundamental rights here and in basic practices like disclosing a privacy policy we are um, ensuring that we are safeguarding these fundamental rights inclu including the right to privacy and um, i think the privacy policy is very essential it's very table stakes um, it discloses to users how their data is being used with whom it's being shared for what purpose what the user's rights are um, i think it's not an exaggeration to say that in practice, most people, I myself, even as a researcher in this field, very rarely actually even read the privacy policy, but it's really important that it's available when a user um, wants to consult it. Um, and so I'm under um, no, um, no pretense that simply publishing this document is going to fix the problem, but I think it's 
one of the first steps we need to take. And it's not a surprise that the privacy scorecard um, unwanted witness um, is putting together. Um, the first criteria of that scorecard is simply the disclosure of a privacy policy. Um, so with any further ado, let me go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully you can see this. Um, maybe if someone can um, just give me a thumbs up or a... Um, oh, we can chat. see it. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I just want to make sure before I continued. All right. Mm -hmm. Um, so thank you, and, and just for reference, I'm part of an NGO based in Berlin called the Tactical Technology Collective, and um, I, with a couple of my colleagues, the last couple of years actually have been focused on understanding how our personal data is being used for political purposes. I thought it would be nice, as I'm not a lawyer by training, I'm a data scientist, as um, Gabriel just mentioned, to take this outside of the legal realm and just look at some practical applications here. So I want to share with you um, one report that um, is going to be published later today. This is a sort of sneak peek that's um, directly relevant to what's happening What's happening in the Ugandan context. Um, my, my colleague's work has focused on exploring how our personal data is being used for political purposes. And one of the ways in which our data is being used politically around the world is through the proliferation of mobile apps. Today, um, now more than ever, um, political candidates and parties around the world are releasing mobile apps, apps that you can download on your phone, install and download on your phone that will allow you to interact with other supporters, um, engage perhaps with um, a polit political candidate who's running for office, make your voice be heard. And we were interested in looking at some political apps in Uganda. And so we looked at the National Resistance Movement's app on iOS. The reason we chose to look at this app, um, not only because the Ugandan context was an interesting one to look at, was because even though um, use of Android in Uganda is far greater than use of iOS. Um, it turned out in the spirit of the first sort of criteria of the privacy scorecard that um, when we dug into the app more closely, there were some things that were missing. So um, this is a screenshot of the app that you would see if you went to download it from the app store, from the iOS app store. Um, you see basic information here, like who the developer was, what the technical requirements were. But what we found interesting about this was that if you look more closely at this first line, it says the developer has not provided details about its privacy practices and handling of data to Apple. Um, in fact, um, there was no privacy policy associated with the National Resistance Movement, National Resistance Movement's app on iOS. Um, and this was the reason why we thought this would be an interesting app to investigate. Um, the functionality was rather limited, and we thought we had one working hypothesis that suggested that maybe because the functionality of the app is quite um, simple, perhaps it's um, collecting and using user data very securely. Um, but um, just answering these basic questions about what data is being collected, with whom is it's being shared, under what legal basis, what redress the user has, um, we were totally in the dark about that. So that's one of the reasons why we decided to look at the app. And this piece is going to be published shortly after this talk today, so you can read about it in more detail. But I just wanted to preview some of the um, highlights before talking about the role of the data collector more generally. Um, one thing that you might not, not know um, about um, taking images on your mobile devices is that there is what's called exchangeable image file format data. I don't want to get too much into the technicality. I don't want to bore anyone with any technical details, but just to say that anytime you take a photo, there's actually data attached to that photo called metadata, data about data. Um, things like the photo size, its format, when it was taken, with what kind of device, um, sometimes also if a face was detected in the photo, what level of zoom was used, all these sorts of things um, that are attached to photos. And in the process of analyzing the National Resistance Movement's app on iOS, um, we found access to um, the um, web hosting company, basically the servers upon which all the app's data was being held. And on the server, there were links that were freely accessible. And through this link, we were able to very easily access users' actual photos that they had uploaded to the to the app. Um, here are some blurred images of some of these users. They look like selfies that they'd taken for their profiles on the app. Um, 
this itself is not so particularly um, glaring an issue. Um, in fact, in the app itself, many users have public profile photos. So if you were to interact with them through the app's chat feature, you would be able to see at least a smaller piece of their photo here. But what's interesting is because a lot of these photos have this EXIF data that I was just talking about, things like their size and what level of zoom was used, whether their face was detected. And because the app did not sanitize or did not standardize any of the images that the users have uploaded, we were actually able through the several hundred of Im several hundred images that were uploaded to the app by Ugandan voters um, who probably, I would imagine, expected that their data was being handled properly and securely from these very harmless looking selfies, we were actually able to pinpoint the exact GPS coordinates from which these photos were taken. Um, perhaps this is where the individual is living or um, a place where they frequent perhaps their job. Um, but this is very sensitive data that could be exploited um, for any number of means, for any, for any number of reasons. I will save, um, I'll, I'll leave my discussion of our work at that, but just to say that um, today, soon after this discussion, we will be publishing the report and you can read in more detail about what exactly we find, what exactly we found and what we think it means. But to take a step back from this one particular instance, I think we have to look at, as Alexandrine was saying, sort of the structure of this phenomenon in relation to the data subject the person whose data is being collected and the data controller, the person or the entity that actually does the data collecting. And you know, one individual might be connected to a couple dozen, maybe even a few hundred sort of digital services. But on the flip side, because of this sort of platformization, because of the centralization we see in a lot of these technology services, um, a handful of tech entities, um, and it's not just the big major tech platforms, but even, even a mobile app like the National Resistance Movement app or even a local ride sharing app. I know Nietzsche had recently made a, um, a ruling on a local ride sharing app. Even individual apps end up collecting large sums of data over large collections of people. And this introduces what often is an asymmetric system of costs, costs and benefits. The few sort of platform centralized technology services um, end up benefiting a lot from the data that they collect and the ways in which they can monetize that data. But when things go wrong, that cost is often externalized. The public is the one that pays for it. The user whose data was compromised in the process is the one who, who pays for it. But I would argue that still, even in this case, even when, um, you know, even if we object to um, some of the invasive means by which data is collected, which um, is sort of a separate set of problems outside of the context of just considering what's why is the disclosure of a privacy policy important? Um, so just setting aside that piece of the problem for now, I think um, the role of data collectors and in data protection and privacy policy implementation um, can be seen as um, something that they should do, not simply out of their own goodwill and volition, but something that they should do in pursuit of their own interests. So um, if in a world in which the data that these technology services, the, these data controllers or data collectors, um, in a world in which the data they collect is an asset, a world in which that data they collect is valuable, they have a vested interest in securing that data. Um, if that data is insecure, like um, the images from users that might be monetizable or useful for whatever reason, then the um, then that increases the supply of that data, the access to that data, whether through state or non-state state actors, whether through legitimate actors or illegitimate actors, whether through adversaries or just um, sort of hacker, hackers acting um, you know, more adversarially. Um, and, and if the supply of this information increases, if this highly valuable information increases, its price is going to decrease. Um, and so in turn, you can think even in that case, um, there is a sort of invisible hand at work um, data collectors should have a vested interest in actually securing their own data, um, even if um, solely in the interest of um, maintaining sort of the, um, the monetizability or the um, uniqueness, the value of the data that they're collecting. Of course, that's setting aside the invasive means by which the data they might be collecting is occurring, but just considering um, the case of data protection um, and, the, and the, um, the need to secure data. 
So data collectors, as um, Alexandrine was suggesting, should be doing a lot of these things, publishing privacy policies, maintaining selected third party relationships, informing users of vulnerabilities, fixing disclosed vulnerabilities. So when we found this vulnerability with the National Resistance Movement app, we contacted the app developers repeatedly. They never responded to us. The problem has not been fixed. Um, and so at the very least, when tech collectors are informed of be solving, be fixing them, um, privacy by design practices. And luckily, I think there are a lot of levers by which we have to actually make these things happen that are not just hoping for goodwill. Public and civil society actors can grow more judicious about the personal data that they're sharing, raise awareness of privacy respecting alternatives to otherwise privacy invasive technolo technological services. And of course, as Alexandrine was suggesting, um, legislating um, importantly with means that are actually enforceable. And for organizations like NIDA or um, other like consumer rights organizations, penetration testing, stress testing um, is important through government entities, um, actually imposing financial penalties when laws are, are um, broken. I think we're not in a position of just hoping that tech, but excuse me, that data collectors do the right thing. I think we actually have some levers to actually ensure that they do the right thing. Anyway, um, I know I have just 10 minutes, so I'll leave it at that. But thank you so much for your time. And I'd be happy to take any questions later. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Of course, the question on people's mind is, now that you've shared this, what do the people who have that app, what should they do? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think um, it also speaks to a piece of doing this work that's, that's also important that perhaps other participants on this call might be interested in. Um, you know, doing security research is um, is a very sensitive thing. Um, and, and, you know, there's we made, I think, a very strong effort to um, go through the standard mechanisms of responsible disclosure, of identifying a vulnerability, communicating the vulnerability to the um, responsible party, communicating it to them repeatedly, not having any response. Um, so I think, um, you know, this one case, I would say in many ways is one particular isolated incident. I think the, the bigger lesson to be taken from this is that um, we should all be thinking carefully about um, where we share our personal data and, and also realizing, hopefully there's a, a small piece of this that has to do with basic digital literacy something as harmless as a photo actually um, communicates a lot more under the surface than we might realize. And it's not, in addition to that, it's not just a matter of being selective about with whom we share our data. Of course, the people sharing their data here were presumably supporters of the national resistance movement. It's not only enough to say, I need to make sure I'm not sharing my data with someone I suspect to be an adversary, but even realizing that um, organizations and entities and political candidates with whom we might feel aligned and acting in solidarity, um, even in, in even when they have the best of intentions, even when we might see them as a counterpart, a sort of like aligned counterpart, um, our, we might be risking our own data, even when sharing, um, even when sharing with entities like that. Right. So I think um, the short answer is that I think we just need to be more judicious, judicious in general when it comes to sharing our data. This one app is probably one of um, many, certainly one of thousands around the world in which users' data is being compromised in ways that we don't realize. But I think um, will hopefully motivate um, some of the other um, speakers on this call to, um, you know, to realize that we should be doing this applied work of actually assessing whether the tech products and services that we're using are meeting these standards. And just to speak very quickly about the privacy scorecard. You know, of the, pro of the five criteria you mentioned, Gabriel, at the opening, um, is the privacy policy published? This would fail in that regard. Is there sort of a communication of the user's rights? There is no privacy policy here. There is no additional communication about that. The app store says um, that will be, the, the iOS, sorry, the iOS app store says that this will be communicated upon the, next, the app's next update. Uh, but as of now, there's no communication about that. So it fails on that second criteria. Um, is there disclosure of how this data is being shared with third parties? It fails on that criteria. There is no disclosure on that front. Um, is there robust data security measures in place? Um, we were able to freely access through publicly available means um, the precise location from which a number of the National Resistance Movement Party supporters um, took these photos. That seems like very invasive data. Basic security practices were not adhered to. It fails on that 
front. With regard to the fifth criteria, how much was collected and how much was sort of is retained by the data collector itself and how much is shared. That is, it's, it's difficult to say because we have no information about with whom the this information is being shared. So it just seems that with respect to the five criteria you mentioned, this instance fails on four of those five fronts. Um, hopefully- um, And possibly motivator. fails on the fifth as well. And very likely fails on the fifth. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, right. I've, I've taken enough time. Um, thank you so much for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions later. Thank you, thank you. I think it's an excellent time to segue into, you know, what data controls individuals in today's digital economy are expecting. So let's go over to uh, Linda, Alinda Ikanza. She's a passionate uh, person about practicing, teaching, and innovating the law. She has over 12 years experience in commercial law practice. She practices law as a partner and advocate at Amba Solicitors and Advocates. Linda founded Nkola App, which provides information on employment rights using the USSD platform. She believes that technology and digital transformation can further access to justice and make the practice of law more uh, efficient and sustainable. The Nkola app that I just spoke about was selected among the top 10 global innovations of 2019 by the Hague Institute for Innovating Law and the best Ugandan legal innovation of 2020 by the Global Legal Hackathon. She was awarded the best 2019 uh, female lawyer in private practice uh, by the Uganda Law Society. And she was also named among the top 40 Ugandans under 40 for the year 2019. Linda's greatest inspiration is to leave her four daughters a better world for women than the world she found. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, over to Linda, who again will be speaking about what data controls individuals in today's digital economy are expecting and demanding. Linda, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gabriel. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. You have to warn the audience that when it comes to data, uh, none of that uh, elaborate background applies. I'm a novice in data. Bad. And, uh, Top 40 under 40. Please go right ahead. <laughs> I'm a novice um, in this data world, and um, I'm very honored to share this platform with um, amazing panelists like you. I'm actually the student here. So it will be interesting for me to speak to what we ignorant users expect because um, if data is the new law, uh, sorry, if data is the new gold or if data is the new oil, then uh, I think the average Ugandan is like that guy in Vinyoro who was walking on land, he had no idea, had all those barrels of oil underneath, or that uh, guy in Karamoja who is walking on top of marble and has no idea about it. That's, that's, that's the scenario that many of us are in because we, we don't realize that data, uh, particularly for the digital world that we are now living in, and for the market that is data driven that we now operate in, data is a very big resource. Uh, so I think that the beginning point is to see how to balance the our rights, because it would be it would be a loss if we went to our graves with all our data rights protected, but the opportunity been realized and at the end of the day the, the, we must balance the risk and uh, the opportunities that come from from data so I, I have a I have a small presentation that I wanted to share particularly on um, on some of the aspects that the different um, provisions of the law give us as um, as individuals in the data in the data market or in this digital economy, I'll just share my screen if that is okay with you, Gabriel. Yeah. 
Yes, we can see your screen. All right. Yeah, so, so my question, which I hope to finish in about five minutes so we can get back to the experts is, is just to set the ball rolling, my, my purpose. So what I want to do with you, our viewers, and those of you joining us, is just to tickle your minds and how well you know how, what rights you have under the data protection laws in Uganda and what you can expect and demand from, from these different people that collect our data. So uh, one of the questions I saw in the chat was who is a data collect controller? And um, I think that you have to come from the background of knowing what the examples of your data that you've collected. You know, all these things are your data, whether it's your email, your username, your passwords, even those simple things such as uh, somebody collecting your ID at uh, an entrance of an area. I have been known to be one of them that I don't see why you have to use my national ID. I don't see why a guard has to keep my national ID with him just because I have to access a building. And many times we don't realize how much threat, how much identity threat, uh, theft, and, and those kinds of um, data breaches we expose ourselves to just by not realizing the gold that we are carelessly living around in our different daily activities. So whether it is a hospital that wants to know your age or your medical background, or just like um, uh, the woman uh, has been talking to us about our photos, our phone numbers, all this is data. And, and then those of us that come from the academic world, we collect a lot of data from our students and the law governs how we must use it. And the fact that we must use it strictly for the purposes we collect it, but also only for the duration that those purposes are being served. So what rights should you expect? First of all, we have to, we, we have, to have access to that personal data from whoever uh, collects it, who is the data controller in this case. And we have, to, we have the right to prevent and stop the processing of that personal information if it causes us any damage. Um, we have the right to prevent the data collecting from processing our data for direct marketing. Um, everything that makes data the new gold is because it determines our, our, or our data and purchasing habits. So every time you look at that dress online or you click on that weight product, uh, that weight loss product, you're going to see that a lot more of that is what is going to pop up in your, in your, in your different social media feeds. And that's because your data is being used to, to market whatever your need is to the different people that have products they can sell you. So we have the right to prevent data collectors from processing our personal data for direct marketing. And then we also have the right to require a data collector to ensure that any decision taken on our behalf is not based solely on the processing of automatic means of personal data, okay? And what this basically means is if somebody is collecting your data for marketing purposes, then you should know about it and you should consent to it. And as much as possible, that consent should not be uh, obtained in a sort of, a, shall I say, a misrepresented way, okay? So that um, you don't realize that this is what you're signing up for. Uh, and then lastly, we, ha we have the right to require a data collector to rectify, update, block, erase, or destroy our information. Because at the end of the day, it is our information that we've shared and we retain the rights to make sure that its use does not keep on infringing with the rest of our other dignity and our other purposes as individuals. So what are the, what, what can you, what are these data collectors? Um, barred from doing. They can't unlawfully obtain or disclose our personal data. They have to destroy and delete or conceal or alter our personality. Sorry, they, they are barred from destroying, deleting or altering our personality. And of course they are barred from selling 
our personal data. And um, around election time, uh, what a lot of our personal data was sold to different candidates that wanted to reach us. And for many of us, we didn't even realize that that there um, was a breach, which if we could prove, NITA could have taken action on. And that takes me to how you take that action. If, you're, if our data rights are violated, then under the data protection and privacy law, we can lodge a complaint with NITA. And I'm glad that um, uh, we, we have Stella here from NITA. Maybe she can tell us if the different enforcement mechanisms of NITA have now been uh, activated, whether we, we have um, any desk or any level of enforcement of this right to lodge a complaint with NITA, because then NITA would have to investigate that complaint and take action. But on the other hand, if you actually suffer any damage from a data breach, then you can go to a private lawyer such or, or, or you yourself can lodge a complaint in our normal courts of law against that data controller, that data processor, or, or that data collector. And lastly, I thought I should speak to the different things that we need to bear in mind as we balance the risks and opportunities in data. Um, a lot of us are not protecting ourselves first and foremost. We're not protecting our businesses. We're not caring or treating this very valuable resource with the protection that it deserves. So you find that you leave your children your phone, they download whatever they want to download or manner of games, but that phone also happens to have your bank account. It probably also has a lot of your other details and you're not being, um, you're not advocating or enforcing the rights that are within your control in the first place. Huh? Or you find out that someone has breached your data and you don't take any action about it. Uh, we are being very complacent in how we enforce or take a stand against the data breaches at a very personal level to the extent that no amount of law can protect a complacent or uh, an in somebody that doesn't value whatever is being protected. So we have to realize that data is an economic resource and use it as such. And as, as individuals, we have to invest in the digital skills that can help us maximize our data. You know, you have a Facebook page but you for your business, but you've never looked at the data analytics, you've never taken advantage of any parts of them that help you um, use that network that you have to advance your business, but you also haven't developed your capacity at any level to transform that raw data into any form of market intelligence. And in how you choose which products to use, you're not rewarding those that protect our rights. You're not looking at the privacy policy data or, or the different apps that you use, everything that pops up in your window, you just agree, I agree, I consent. You know, many times there's an alternative, there's another service provider that is thinking about your data protection rights that you would rather choose to engage with as a reward for them investing in your data rights. So basically, as just going back to what I wanted to speak to us about, we have so many controls that we can expect as individuals in today's digital economy, but I don't want your minds to be fixated so much on the rights and the risks so that you will miss out on the opportunity. Thank you very much, Linda. And uh, I'm guessing that your app is a very secure one and uh, it ticks all those five boxes that uh, uh, Varun was telling us about. <laughs> Uh, that's exactly why we are still stuck in the USSD uh, forum, um, despite being very uh, sort of behind the technological uh, potential. It, it is one that is very secure in terms of uh, collecting data and using it for, for, for the different purposes. So for example, when you uh, want to use our app 
one of the things we do is let you know that the information you great, we will need your information in order to answer uh, your queries. And we have kept, we, we delete that information on a monthly basis so that it's um, collection is not abused by anybody as well as we, we do not share it with anyone um, for any purposes. All right, just needed to make sure of that. Thank you, thank you very much, Linda. <laughs> I've realized uh, from the presentations that there are a number of things that Stella will have to respond to. So I was going to invite Stella at this point, but let me invite the second Linda that we have so that if she also raises things that Stella needs to respond to in her presentation, she can go ahead and do so. Being the regulator means that a lot of these things come to your doorstep. All right. Uh, Linda Bonio is the founder of the Lawyers Hub, a Pan-African community of lawyers working to employ technology to ease access to justice for tech startups, improve digital skills for lawyers, and offer policy alternatives within the tech policy arena to African governments. In 2017, Linda founded the Lawyers Innovation Hub in Nairobi, the first legal tech hub in Africa to support tech startups and cross-disciplinary collaborations in law and technology. Linda is an advocate of the High Court of Kenya and serves in the ICT committee of the Regional Bar Association, uh, such as the Pan-African Lawyers Union and the East African Law Society. She is a firm believer in the power of legal innovation as a catalyst for social economic growth. She is a 2020 Tech Woman Emerging Leaders Fellow and winner of the 2020 Good ID Global Awards on Privacy and Digital Identity. Ladies and gentlemen, Linda Monio, uh, who will be speaking about the practical benefits of formal accountability mechanisms. Linda, over to you. Thank you very much. And I appreciate the introduction. Uh, greetings from Nairobi, Kenya. I hope that you're all doing well. Um, it's, um, it's interesting what they say about Kenya and Uganda. If Uganda sneezes, we catch a cold. Um, and if we sneeze as well, Uganda catches a cold. Especially ah, Uganda dies people. when you sneeze. Oh, we, we die. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're landlocked, right? <laughs> Yeah, so um, it's, it's really good to see the, the cross development that's happening, you know, um, between, you know, your country on data protection laws, um, as well as that's what's happening in, in Kenya. Um, and um, just so you know, Kenya is, has a data privacy law. And uh, we recently, uh, the, the government recently published the regulations um, about maybe two weeks ago, uh, the regulations that would sort of kickstart the, um, the data pro uh, protection um, office. Um, and that means registration of data controllers. Um, they're also thinking about um, lodging complaints on how the public can lodge complaints around data protection. Um, and then now we also have general regulations that sort of say, um, you know, what Linda was talking about um, on building up um, on, on what are the rights of you as a data subject, what are the, you know, the, the obligations that must come from the data processor um, and uh, data processor or data controller. So some of the, um, if you just want to know the difference and people wonder who's a data controller, who's a processor, but most of the time a data controller is the person in charge. He's the one who says what you do with that data. Sometimes you're a data processor and you're not a controller, and maybe that's a third party. So imagine being like a social media influencer working for a particular company. So maybe on their Twitter or Instagram, you're taking their orders, you know, you're process processing these orders. You're not ideally the person in charge, but you are that third party. If you're selling tickets for, let's say, a concert, you know, or you're selling tickets to Amsterdam on behalf of maybe Uganda Airlines or Kenya Airways, that makes you a third party. You know, and, and many times they subcontract these sort of roles. Um, so it's important to, to know that difference. So I think that's that's the, the far that Kenya is you know going. I read the regulations from Uganda this week, um, and in many you know ways, 
the provisions around auto, you know, automated decision making, which is one of the things that are coming up, you know, with data. We've seen, for instance, in Kenya, there's a lot of digital lending companies that give you loans on on on, on your phone, um, and so there's been a way in which they use your social media data. Um, so if you're signing in. Um, they will take your social media data to, be, to, you know, to use it to give you a loan. Um, and so the data protection regulations are coming in to say that they don't need to simply judge you on the data available, but they need to give you an opportunity to be heard uh, so, so that we don't judge people on, um, on, on just their data. Uh, some social media companies as well, some credit lending companies uh, would also take in your They'd also take in your, your, your SMSs, you know, um, they'll read your text messages. If you don't comply by paying back a loan, they SMS all your relatives and all your contacts. So some of those are not good data practices. And, you know, Uganda should not take them over from, from Kenya, from the experience that we've had with some of the lending companies. And so I just wanted to build up um, on what Alex, uh, Alexandrine, I think, sorry for the mispronunciation, where well, she talked about formal, you know, accountability mechanisms. And I just want to, you know, uh, reiterate the importance of having accountability mechanisms. You know, some people wonder what's the importance of actually having data protection laws and how does that help? I think it's important from both the data subject, which is most of us who, whose data is used everywhere, um, but then also on data controllers. That number one, data protection laws and formal accountability mechanisms be, help us to build trust. When people actually know that if they give you my data, you're going to make good use of it, that you will not abuse it, you will not share it with third parties, you will not sell it, and you will use it for the purpose of which you already told me. I think that builds trust within society, even amongst corporates. Um, and now, you know, within within Kenya, for instance, the law, the regulations require that, you know, uh, there must be some contractual relationship between the processor um, and the data controller. So if you're giving data to a third party, don't just give them like that. You need to sign a contract and say, I'm giving you this data to maybe do analytics on it, or maybe just mark the exams. If the university is giving, you know, um, you know, you as a lecturer to mark exams, for example. So that particular data still belongs to the university, but you have maybe a contract of employment that talks about data protection laws. So I think that building trust makes us, you know, do business better, engage better society. If political parties that own data, you know, you know that they're not going to abuse that data. They'll not sign you up to political parties you don't belong to. We've had some parties in Kenya where you signed up to a political party just because someone had your ID number you know, um, and so that should not, you know, really happen. And then number two, um, it's data protection is becoming a, a business, you know, um, it's, it's becoming like a, a business model where and you get a competitive edge by simply saying that as an organization, we are data compliant, we are certified in this way. And so you're seeing a lot of companies coming from Europe, for instance, are looking for companies that actually already are either certified to, you know, under GDPR, that they actually, you know, um, know these particular laws and they comply internally. The third thing I wanted to talk about is actually just building a culture of compliance, you know, within an organizational setup. You can't just, you know, um, comply with data protection law only, um, you know, and say we are taking this box. It has to start from, you know, the, the ground up. That you know, what data are we con collecting? And we know within data laws, it's really important to do data impact assessment. An impact assessment is, for instance, if you want to build a house, you need to think through, okay, how much is gonna, this house is going to be? Um, has this place been flooded before? Who are my my neighbors? Are they noisy? You know, things like that. And so in any project that you're beginning also, you think through what are the impacts, um, the data impacts. If you're collecting data at, you know, the guard is collecting data, does he have the, the, the opportunity, you know, does he have, is he responsible enough to hold this data? Can this data be taken in some other way? So it's really important in that way too. Uh, it encourages that, you know, compliance culture within an organization. And then also too, I think we need to talk about you know, um, enforcement. And that's what the government is actually going to really talk about. The government will come and enforce, you know, are you really listening to your data subjects? You know, are you abusing, you know, um, the data that they have given you? So you must look at enforcement at organizational level. And, and many times when you talk about data protection, people see it as just small businesses. Um, within the law in Kenya, they've expanded, you know, um, the data protection regulations to to anyone, even within government, even public bodies, 
are actually complying with data protection laws and also churches so churches that are you know uh, if your church goes online and they're on zoom they're collecting your emails and things like that so it means that we need to already you know uh, tell everybody to comply because if there's a data breach and you know how data breaches actually work is that just having your email out there is is maybe nothing but the combination of your email and your phone number um, and maybe your location means that somebody can actually know your bank account and maybe they can replace your SIM card because we see that in some countries where somebody steals your line, um, they go replace your SIM card once your phone is off and then they're able to withdraw money from your account or even lend, uh, they borrow money from online platforms and maximize those limits. So it's important for us to really talk about, about that. I also want to talk about the international mechanisms of, 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 of talking, and this is my final point, but it's really good to talk about adequacy provisions. We've seen how the US is trying to negotiate with on GDPR on how US companies can actually trade with the EU without coming up with you know, new laws within the US. So it's called adequacy. Within Africa, it's Mauritius that has applied for adequacy status in the GDPR um, under the European Union. So they're seeing that if we get adequacy status within Europe, then it means that our companies can trade you know, easily between Europe um, and Mauritius. And I think that needs to happen for all of us, that even as we trade, that we know if my data is in Uganda, Uganda has an adequate law. And I see your regulations actually have provided for that, that before you transfer data to another country, that it, it must be in tandem with the laws, it must have adequacy status within Uganda. And I think that really helps in terms of formal mechanisms that we know if I'm coming from Kenya, my data is actually safe in this particular country. And also think, uh, Finally, on attracting foreign investments, you know, people are looking for data, countries that have good data protection law and enforcement of those laws. So that data protection is just not a tick in the box that, you know, we just have the law, but can people actually complain and say, I never want to receive that text again. I never want to be on your mailing list. You know, I never want you to, you know, treat me as just a data subject and automate my data. Um, I think that should be the next level of engaging within, within Uganda. But I really want to appreciate the privacy scorecard. I think that's a really great move to have um, by unwanted witness. We'd be happy to be those partners in Kenya, you know, to also do this in Kenya because having the law without having mechanisms in which you can judge, you know, compliance would be defeating. And so I think this is a really good progress. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we're running a bit late. Therefore, I'd like to request all the panelists, please visit the Q&A tab. And if you're able to respond to the questions that have been raised there. Alex, thank you very much for responding to, I believe, David's question. Uh, we have questions from two other participants. I'd like to encourage uh, participants, please share your questions on the Q in the Q&A tab. And, uh, our panelists will be able to respond. I'd like now to go over to Stella, who is from Nita U. I did introduce her earlier on, but just as a recap, Stella has been uh, practicing law as an advocate for the last 22 years, and she is the Director of Regulation and Legal Services at Nita U. That is the regulator here in Uganda. Uh, she'll be speaking to us on insights on what contraventions the uh, data Protection and Privacy Act regulators uh, look for and how your DPPA compliance initiative can successfully meet legal requirements while also satisfying your customers' needs. Stella, over to you. Stella? All right. Uh, just a minute, I want to um, I hope uh, you can see my screen. Yes, we can. If you could just put it in presentation mode. Uh, just a minute. Just a minute. 
Um, I would like, first of all, to thank Unwanted Witness for this opportunity uh, to make this presentation, to uh, participate with all these uh, eminent um, speakers. Uh, such events give us an opportunity to be able to interact with uh, a number of people, uh, regulators, uh, citizens, um, data controllers, and the like. So I'm very grateful for this uh, opportunity. As indicated by Gabriel, I was requested to, uh, to talk about uh, the things that the regulator will be looking for, what we think the regulator will be looking for, and uh, some of the compliance um, mechanisms that we expect to see amongst the data controllers and uh, data processors. Um, I thought I needed to share that slide. Uh, most of the speakers, Alexandrine, Varun, uh, Linda, uh, the two Lindas have already talked about it. The fact that we have a lot of data that is uh, moving around. And uh, when we use uh, big data, um, we note that every two days, we create information greater than the beginning of time to 2003. So you can imagine what kind of, how much that data is. 90% uh, of the data in the world was created in the last two years. So it shows you that uh, right now, even as we speak, we are creating much, much more data. Um, uh, the total amount of data stored by industry doubles every 1.2 years. Uh, these statistics were done a few years back, so I'm sure that uh, uh, right now, the statistics are actually higher than what we have. Uh, much of this data uh, includes personal information, maybe even about 30 or 40% or even 50%, because in many cases, when we interact with Google, they will be able to know our location. They will be able to, uh, in some cases, even find uh, data that belongs to those people who are connected to us. As uh, indicated by Varun, many of us, uh, we take videos, we enjoy WhatsApp, we enjoy Facebook, we enjoy, uh, we utilize Gmail, we utilize uh, Yahoo Mail and all these uh, digital uh, innovations, but we are not mindful of how they impact our privacy. Um, uh, all the speakers have spoken to the need for the Data Protection and Privacy Act, and I will not really dwell on it. Uh, but its uh, objective is to give effect to Article 27 of the Constitution, which provides for privacy of uh, Ugandan citizens. Um, it regulates the collection and processing of personal information, and most of all, protects the privacy of the individual and uh, personal data. Um, I wasn't sure if uh, the other panelists would talk about what personal data is, because in many cases, uh, you find people don't actually understand what personal data. And the act defines it to mean information about a person uh, from which the person can be identified that is recorded in any form, uh, but also provides examples, the nationality, the age, the marital status, the education level, uh, the occupation, the identification number, such as the NIN, the identity data, and all that. And I think Linda, Linda Alinda spoke uh, very well about that. So having now understood what personal data is, because my assumption is that uh, on this webinar, we have lawyers, we have uh, citizens who may not really understand some of these uh, uh, legalese. So it was very important for us to define what personal data is. Now on the Things that uh, the Personal Data Protection Office will be looking out for. Uh, Alexandrine spoke, uh, she ably elaborated the principle of uh, accountability, which addresses most of the things that I'm going to be talking about. So I'll apologize for repeating myself. But I think, Gabriel, you now note that uh, when we are talking about data protection, in many cases, we talk about the same. Uh, the same things using different languages, using 
uh, different examples. Now, it's very important that all the data controllers, the data processors, the data controllers uh, comply with the principles of data protection. Uh, for instance, when we recently did um, the investigation uh, on the um, ride hailing uh, app, these are some of the things we're looking for because a general complaint, yes, had been raised, but when we went in, we had to look at all these principles. How are they dealing uh, with them? How are they dealing with uh, personal information that comes into their hands? So we have about seven principles or so. Uh, accountability, this has been ably explained by Alex, uh, Alexandrine. Um, we apologize if we, <laughs> we pronounce it wrong. Um, I think what we need to know about accountability in Uganda, when we hear the word accountability, we always think we are counting as we account for, let's say, funds or resources in government. But in this case, when it comes to data protection, as ably explained by Alexandrine, it is about demonstrating your compliance with the data protection law or the data protection principles that you must adhere to. Our lawfulness, the requirement that whatever personal data you collect, you do it fairly and within the law. What is the legal regime that allows you to collect this data? Uh, is it that you have a contract with a data subject? Uh, is it that you're providing a service, a, a service you may be a data processor pro, uh, providing a service to a data controller, and as a result, you're able to collect this inf information and uh, process it. So it's very important that it is lawful. Minimality means you collect what you need. In other words, it must be adequate, it must be relevant and not uh, excessive. You should only retain it for the period for which you need it or for the purpose for which you require uh, that information. You must ensure the quality of information collected, processed, used or held. Transparency is very important, and I think unwanted witness, uh, particularly in the privacy scorecard, have uh, elaborated the need for transparency. How do you enable the data subject to participate in this process? How much information do you provide the data subject uh, before you collect their information? How transparent is uh, your privacy policy? Some of the things we look for when we are investigating uh, data breaches or uh, non-compliance with the law, we look at uh, how accessible is your privacy policy. We found that in many cases, yes, um, an organization may have a privacy policy, but it is in very fine print. It is found, uh, if I was maybe looking at a, a presentation, you find it at the very end. We want that privacy policy to be at the forefront. You'll note that most of the compliant companies uh, when you log into their website, that box with a cookie will come up and within those few sentences, they'll be able to direct you uh, to their privacy policy. When you click on that link, you'll be able to see a summary of their privacy policy. And then you'll also have a link uh, to their detailed uh, privacy policy. Those are the things we'd like to see uh, when we come to uh, audit or do compliance assessments for data controllers. Security is very important, as I indicated, most of, we are collecting a lot of data because data is gold, because data enables uh, these guys, uh, to optimize the services they provide to us. But once we release this data to them, they have an obligation to make sure that they've secured it. So at every analysis, whether a compliance analysis, uh, whether uh, a breach has occurred, or whether um, uh, we've received a complaint, the first thing that we we'll look at is how this entity is complying with these uh, seven principles. We believe these principles are the bedrock of any data protection regime in any entity. And we believe that if you comply with these principles, um, uh, you'll have taken
Stella? Right, unfortunately, it seems like we've lost Stella. Her network seems to have frozen. Let's just give it a few seconds. Oh, really? Oh, there, there you are. All right, you can go. You can, can go. Can you hear me? Yes, now we can. Okay, apologies for that. Okay, so I was saying that uh, these principles are the bedrock of any data protection and privacy uh, framework, and we encourage our uh, controllers, processors uh, to come internationally because these are international principles that you'll find in America, you'll find in Europe, you'll find across Africa, uh, you'll find them wherever you go. You have made great steps uh, in uh, ensuring the privacy of your customer's data. Uh, but beyond the uh, principles, the office will be looking for uh, compliance with the prescribed obligations of the data controllers, which are actually provided for in the regulations and in the parent act. We've, uh, we cannot um, underscore the need to develop and publish a privacy policy because that is the yardstick against which any customer, any user will be able to determine whether they should actually deal with you or to be given information on how you're going to utilize their data. It's very critical that you register with the uh, Personal Data Protection Office. It's a requirement of the law. Uh, one of the benefits of registering um, within the form itself is uh, uh, information that is required that if you complete truthfully, will also help you analyze how uh, you use data, why you need that, that data, and how you're going to process that data. So it's very important uh, that you register. Uh, you need to designate or appoint a data protection officer depending on your circumstances. It's important for the controller to understand the rights of the data subjects and enable them to exercise their rights. And uh, this was ably uh, spoken to by Linda, uh, Linda in her enumeration of the rights of the data subjects. But the office will go beyond that. Yes, you are aware of the data subject rights, but on your systems, how have you enabled them to submit complaints? For instance, within your systems, how have you enabled segregation of uh, their personal information to, for you to enable, uh, for you to be able to answer, for instance, a data access request uh, from a data subject. Those are the things we'll be looking for. Uh, it's important for the data controllers to also understand their obligations. There are a number of obligations, such as reporting breaches, uh, registration with the office, uh, requirements to correct data, and the like. Most importantly, you must take technical and organizational measures necessary to protect our personal data from unlawful access and disclosure. And in our analysis, um, if we do an audit or some of the things we expect, and I think these are, have also been covered under the uh, privacy scorecard, is to understand what measures have you put in place? What are the technical measures uh, for your systems? What organizational measures are there? Because sometimes, yes, we have all the technical uh, uh, paraphernalia that we need, but in many cases, uh, the weakest link is actually your staff members. Uh, requirement have been trained, or they've been uh, provided with uh, the information they need to be able to fully understand their obligations and to comply with the act. Uh, briefly on how compliance can successfully meet legal requirements and customers' needs, I'll probably repeat myself again and uh, the other panelists. It's important that uh, data controllers establish a privacy governance framework. And uh, this may include, for instance, uh, conducting an internal personal data statement. When you collect all this information, maybe you're collecting 20 fields. Do you actually need all those 20 fields? You need to be mindful that um, the more data you collect, the more responsibility uh, that you have. Uh, if I'm only collecting um, a mobile number and a name, 
I'll probably have less risk than someone who is collecting uh, date of birth, uh, collecting facial recognition uh, uh, photos, uh, collecting thumbprints and all that. So collect only that data that you need uh, for the purposes for which you need it. Uh, right. Designating a data protection officer and empowering them. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, and empowering them is very important. Uh, training staff, I've already talked about that. Uh, developing a data privacy management framework that you can use internally uh, and that you can communicate to your stakeholders and that is the staff, the board, and maybe your uh, stakeholders so that you understand from the bottom of the organization to the top, how data protection or privacy will be handled. Um, in many cases, we think um, data protection is at the C-suit level, but we need to know that even that receptionist, uh, that person who is cleaning your office needs to know what their responsibilities are for better security of personal information. Uh, the benefit of establishing this privacy governance network is that you will be deemed to be a more transparent uh, partner and uh, Linda uh, from Kenya, I think elaborated that. When you're clearly seen by the customers as someone who is treating their uh, data with respect, you actually have a competitive edge against other companies. Um, or you must ensure uh, the other aspect that uh, is important for compliance is you must uh, collect that data or uh, that personal data uh, lawfully, and you must provide the data subject with all the relevant information uh, to enable them make uh, an informed decision. And this information should be clear and easily accessible because then that will create customer trust and uh, awareness, which benefits you as a company, but also benefits uh, the consumer. Uh, you must embed data protection into your operations. We talked about these issues, uh, data protection impact assessments. Uh, we talked about um, um, uh, technical and organizational measures. And this gives assurance to customers that their personal data is secure. You must do your due diligence when you deal with processors and other third parties uh, to create that trust for the customers. You must uh, enter contracts, uh, specific contracts with them that oblige them to um, comply with the law, but also should enable you uh, to have mechanisms to check uh, that compliance. Okay. Uh, we've talked about facilitating uh, a, uh, the, the data subject rights by ensuring that uh, you, uh, you provide the mechanisms within which they can exercise their rights, and that way you empower the customers. Thank you very much, Gabriel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Linda. And thank you to all our panelists. Uh, <laughs> though it has taken longer than we had planned, We've had all our panelists uh, present and to actually respond to a couple of things that have been raised by you. I'd like to encourage all our panelists, please check both the Q&A and the chat. Uh, there's quite a bit of, you know, information, uh, questions in both the Q&A and the chat. And I'd like to just go to Stella. Varun raised an issue around an application that you know they took through the various tests, the mm. NRM app. Mm. Any concerns that raises for you as the regulator? Uh, yes, that raises uh, concerns, and uh, we are looking forward uh, to Varun and uh, his uh, team issuing the report. We shall review that report and take up that matter. Mm. Uh, you'll note, uh, for instance. Um, the investigation that was done on the ride hailing hub uh, app actually was derived from a complaint that was raised by an unwanted witness. So we do receive uh, these complaints and uh, we'll follow them up. Um, if I could be allowed, I could also respond to, uh, I think Linda, Linda, Linda had a question on uh, the complaint mechanism. If I could respond yes, to that. Yes, go right ahead. I was in a bit of a rush. 
uh, so I didn't uh, uh, respond to that. Yes, the uh, part, part nine of the regulations provides for uh, complaint mechanisms and uh, it provides for uh, complaints to the data processor, data controllers, and then complaints to the, uh, uh, to the office. So that is provided for, and um, it's provided for all the way to the appeal process. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Varun, since you are on, let me go ahead and ask this question that uh, has been sent in by Lewis. So Lewis says that Apple has released a software update that will allow users to say no to having their data collected by apps. In your view, is this a good move? Thanks. I was actually in the process of typing up a, um, a response, but this is much, it's much easier to speak. Um, yes, I think it's great. Um, you know, one of the things that um, is, I think, a win for civil society organizations like Tactful Tech and, um, you know, a lot of the other organizations represented here is that um, for a long time, we have been trying to raise awareness about these privacy related issues among users, among voters. And the fact that a company like Apple is um, moving in a more privacy conscious, privacy respecting manner um, is not only, I think, a step in the right direction for um, users and voters whose privacy is going to be respected, but it's also in Apple's eyes, a good move for Apple um, in differentiating its services from other products that are on the market. Um, so I think this is absolutely um, a good thing. It's always, a, just to say as well, it's also a trick, I think. Um, there's, there's a fine continuum when it comes to security and privacy, the sort of um, trade-off that always exists between how much, um, what level of decision-making do you want to be centralized and controlled and sort of um, made by the infrastructure or sort of systematized, and how much of that do you want to leave to the user themselves to decide um, what level of, of sort of what their risk tolerance is. And I think this is um, an interesting and can be a very academic discussion, but in practice, um, I think that we want for the vast majority of users out there, for myself, even as a researcher in this field, um, I want to be using services that are just defaulting towards being privacy respecting. I think the people who, for whatever reason, have a high risk tolerance or prefer to set up their systems differently, I think many of them have the technical know-how to do that. But for the vast majority of people, um, the fact that Apple, um, whose platform is used by millions of people around the world, is now moving through its iOS update um, towards a more privacy respecting platform um, is absolutely a step in the right direction. All right. I'd like to put this one to Linda Bonio. Uh, somebody asked a question around where we find ourselves, you know, the users, not literate enough in issues of data protection and privacy, and therefore may not really care what's going on. And then the data collectors on the other end, not willing to comply unless they are forced. Is this something that's still too far ahead for our communities? And uh, we're probably, you know, pushing people in a direction they don't see a need to go. I agree. I think we are caught in between. Um, and, you know, the cost of creating awareness is also really high. And as it is now, I'm not sure, you know, especially let's talk about African governments. I'm not sure we have the funding to do this national, you know, um, awareness creation without the support of development partners. And so a lot of the people who are working in this space are coming from civil society groups and not necessarily corporates. You don't see corporates putting in money to teach about you know, data protection as, as CSR. Um, I think so what needs to be done is first, we need to go back to our villages and our people and just tell them the effects of, you know, the impact of their data can have on them. Um, and um, to look at countries that, you know, maybe are far ahead of us. Um, I, I think if you read up a bit on what China has been doing, you know, in China, you can pay up a bill just by showing your face. Um, so with facial recognition, that's your card. You don't have to swipe it. Um, so I think the harms of it has been that there are people whose identity has been stolen. Um, sometimes you don't even want to walk down the street because every street you walk down is, you know, CCTV cameras are capturing your image 
and all that. And so I think, you know, um, we don't have to dwell on the elementary and basic discussions in Africa for too long, uh, because as we continue to talk about the basics, big corporates are actually now getting into facial recognition and, you know, um, we're gonna be left behind again. And then what will happen? We lose even our facial identities in, in that sense. Um, so I think what needs to happen, especially from academia and the lawyers who really know this is happening, we're trying as much as possible to tell lawyers, get in the space and do pro bono legal advice, understand these issues and teach your communities because we don't need outsiders even teaching us these things. We need to teach ourselves, teach our parents, if somebody is stealing their identity, even on, on mobile, teach them how they can stay safe online and how they can actually comply. And I really hope the governments will also be, you know, strong enough to ensure that corporates are actually, you know, put to account. Um, and, you know, we've seen the tendency to pass data protection laws and then it favors, you know, big tech companies and not the people. We don't need to do that. We need to protect the data subjects, you know, fast. Uh, we take, uh, many people say we can take the European approach uh, where they're looking at data subjects speak. first. Yeah, and other people okay. would look at the American approach for businesses. All right, thank you. Alex, I'd actually like to come to you next on uh, the benefit of accountability and whether it can have an effect on what Linda has just been talking about, people actually getting to care and to know that this is actually very important. That's people, individuals, but also corporates. Yeah, I think there, there are two elements here. We've started some of the discussion about, you know, how much is it on the individual versus how much is it on, you know, the responsibility of the, you know, the data controller, or the, the data processor. Um, and I think the example here around the changes that, that Apple have made and some other companies have made is that ultimately it shouldn't be um, dependent on the user's you know, digital literacy um, levels. Um, a lot of it should really be what we've talked about and I mentioned and somebody's asking about it in terms of like privacy by design and by default. Like that is what we should be going towards. Um, and for that to be the standard where it's not reliant on an individual having to go into, you know, into the settings, into the permissions of an app, or even when signing a contract in terms of understanding what is often legal jargon, because we talked a lot about privacy policies being accessible, but the ability, even for some of us as lawyers to read it and get to the fine print, um, it requires a level of understanding, which um, shouldn't be a burden on, on the individual. Um, I think when it comes to um, the accountability um, and the opportunity that comes with accountability and maybe drawing a little bit on the example um, that we've experienced at Privacy International is, um, Similarly to the work that Tactical Tech um, is doing now on this app, um, as and um, Unwanted Witness did on the Safe Boda, uh, we've also been doing um, technical research or at least understanding what is the practice. And I think that's really a key when it in terms of the opportunities of using either exercising our rights um, as individuals or using the powers and the functions of the regulator, is that we can start to compare. Um, the theory, you know, the nice words that these companies put on their websites and their, their contracts with what actually they're doing in practice and whether these match or not, um, because then we can be challenging them um, in a more substantial way, um, because linked also to the question by Andrew here, um, it's, it's really hard to know um, Sorry, it was somebody, Brenton, uh, sorry, in, in the other chat. Um, it's really hard to know when your data has been breached unless something goes wrong. And that often it came with, with privacy is the, the breach or the violation of the right to privacy may be what starts off a chain of reaction of then somebody being denied a loan or being denied access to healthcare. Um, but it's really hard to know when that happens. And, and so when it comes to the opportunity that comes with accountability is to always be checking and, and setting standards and not just at the company level, but something that we've done is to be um, asking the regulator to investigate the practices of a whole industry. And for example, we've done that when it comes to advertising um, companies and understanding the ad advertising com as industry is to be setting a standards that should apply to them that aligns with the data protection laws and regulations um, that are in place. Um, 
and to be really customizing, contextualizing to how they're utilizing some of the exemptions or the loopholes within some of these laws to enable a business model that's based on excessive and arbitrary and um, processing of, of personal data. So there's the opportunity there to use existing accountability mechanisms, both at the individual and regulatory level to say there are consequences. Like right. if, you know, it's no longer that there isn't enough information. If you are not complying with these, we will find out in some way because there are individuals that are exercising their rights and that information will come through. Or there's the work of civil society and other researchers that is documenting these poor practices that, that need to be um, addressed um, by um, regulators, but also in terms of the obligations of data controllers and, and processes. All right. So Unwanted Witness, uh, with other partners, got the regulator to act in relation to the motorcycle riding um, you know, application. How should the regulator, or how do you suggest the regulator can stay on top of, uh, of such things, other than responding or waiting for a complaint? Is there a way in which they can require that some of these things are in place even before an app is made accessible to users? Yeah, I mean, often we're what we call putting out fires and being more reactive when something has gone wrong or we've noticed a poor practice and then we, we challenge it. And that's what Unwanted Witness um, has done, utilizing the regulator. I think in, in the case, in your part of your first question, um, what I want to say is now it's down to, to the regulator that has set a deadline and a requirement, um, you know, an expectation from Safe Boda app to change their policies and practices to then follow up on that. Did they actually change it? And is that being, you know, um, can we see a difference not only in their policy, but in their practice? Um, and for that continuous follow us, because I, I think I mentioned it when I did my presentation, accountability is not, not just added as a one-off, um, they're internal and external factors, and we continuously need to be auditing um, and evaluating whether the safeguards that are put in place are the best practice and whether they're sufficient to um, face some of the, the risks um, that may come with the processing um, of, of personal data. Um, I mean, the, the other aspect, like in the example I was mentioning about, for example, advertising companies, similar example is we're raising awareness among, uh, for example, um, bodies that do electoral monitoring. And we did some of that work uh, with Unwanted Witness and, and other partners that we have. Um, it's really around raising awareness in sectors um, where issues around privacy or data protection um, may not have been looked at, you know, at the forefront to start developing a standards around, you know, what are the risks that are coming with the use of political online political campaigning and and so what are standards that need to be put in place um, by the regulators and not just the data protection regulator, but for example, an electoral commission? Um, should they be developing a standards and minimum safeguards that political actors have to follow um, and anyone else involved in the electoral cycle? So there's definitely an opportunity to start bringing some of those demands to an array of actors. And with COVID, we've done similar work, for example, with public health institutions, or for example, the World Health Organization, is to start bringing some of the concerns that we're seeing um, to their attention so that they set down the best practice and the standards for member states and companies um, to follow. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, all panelists, thank you for responding to the questions in the Q&A and in the chat. Uh, I've seen what's there, and uh, I think the participants are getting their questions responded to. Unfortunately, we're out of time. I'd like to request that we use just 15 more minutes. So I request for 15 more minutes of your time so that we can uh, wrap this up. There's two people who've raised their hands. I'd like to give them an opportunity to ask their questions. Uh, Richard? You can just unmute. You've been given the ability to speak. All right, probably Richard. Maybe Richard's question was responded to. Lewis, your hand is up as well. So let's have Lewis. Yes, Gabriel. Can you hear me? Yes, Lewis, I can hear you, though faintly. Okay. Faintly. Okay, I don't want to go on and on, but let me introduce myself before I can actually go on. Uh, Linda is my lecturer, oh, former lecturer, lecturer at LDC. 
So I thank her for being a panelist. But me personally, I am, I am general counsel with a tech startup called Pixan Technologies. So I think I try to have a fairly, fairly good understanding of data protection and all laws around tech, the tech ecosystem. So now this is it. I'm going to blame Nita. I think unwanted witness for the proactive measures they have taken and uh, how they have tried to put some of us on the business end on to our tours to actually comply with the law. But now this is what I'm requesting of Nita. Nita, it's not enough for you to put up laws and regulations because you see, you realize that oh, with, do, when you don't, when you only do that and you don't give incentives for us in the ecosystem to grow, you're going to kill. For instance, I've put something in the chat that for instance, I, I don't want to compare us to the, U, the US, UK, but it's a good practice. We can adopt it at least. If you are setting up a policy and all loan data protection, it's prudent that you at least subsidize the data centers that we in the ecosystem are utilizing. It's very important. Because if you do not do that and you burden us with regulations, which are by the very, very well intentioned, we are going to collapse. Already, we are actually suffering from, you know, capital intent and raising capital beyond the scaling. Uh, the, the, stage, the st stages of scaling for venture capital, which is Series A and B. African setups, we barely make it beyond the Series B venture capital round to raise financing, to scale and grow. So if you are going to burden us with re these regulations, and you don't give us, and you don't actually go in talks with government, because I, I, according to the regulations and laws, the, the parliament said you're supposed to liaise between various MDAs for the benefit of the ecosystem, more generally the tech startup, or the technology infrastructure generally. So we are requesting for uh, seed enterprise investment schemes and uh, subsidizing with the data centers like the US has done with Google and Google, Apple, and they have subsidized them to an extent. That's one. Then lastly, I don't want to go on and on because I know other people have to say something. Uh, my question again, I think goes to the gentleman in the US. I didn't get the name. It's quite complicated for me to pronounce. Uh, I feel that... Uganda has to do something more in partnership with the US and other develop, develop, development partners to actually develop our, start, our eco startup, our tech eco startup, right. and especially in data protection. Let me, uh, let me give me one 30 seconds. Oh, Gabriel, I'm very sorry I'm going on and on because I have so many things to say, but let me just conclude with this in 30 seconds. Uh, for instance, we, we, we are. The, the, the internet is structured as a commons, a data commons. Huh? But then you have tech companies, the big tech, Google, Apple, and OETC that are using capitalist uh, 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 principles of owning who owns what, and they actually end up selling the data. Huh? Uh, so I am requesting that we should just treat, start treating this data as a data commons, where if someone is to make money off it, he should have actually added value onto it or analyzed it better but not just the sale value of it. Because like this, the, when Tim Berners-Lee came up with the World Wide Web, it, it's such a data commons. These big tech users are infra internet infrastructure to relay their services. So I think at the world over, we should fight for data commons, not actually applying capitalist uh, mentalities of who owns what and the sale value of data. Right. I have more to say, but I think that's all I can say. Thank you very Thank much, Gabriel. Thank you, Louis. Let's have uh, Varun respond first, and then we'll come over to Stella. There's more than one thing for her to respond to. Hi, yes, thank you so much for the question. Um, I think it's a it's a really interesting provocation. Um, you're right. the The internet is like an infrastructural commons. Um, the question of a data commons, I think, um, you know, of course, these platform companies are monetizing the data that we share with them. Um, I think the question, you know, just to say too, just for the sake of the record and, and people who might not be familiar with this already, there are these sort of um, ideas out there, some of which are more fringe than others, but things like um, a universal data income, the universal personal data income. So you get some kind of kickback every time data about you um, is used. And in, and in these cases, at least the ones I read about, um, the user gets to... Um, select very clearly in what cases their data is used and not used. But um, I think the, the question of a universe of a sort of like a data commons, um, I think I need to think a little bit more about it. But as far as I understood it, just from the short time um, since you asked your question, um, I 
I think to me, like a lot of the same questions about who has access to what, under what circumstances, how will this information be used? Where do we, how do we delineate between what data is deemed private, what data is deemed public? Um, I think a lot of those questions still remain in a world with a data commons. Um, you know, there's information about myself that I, I would never, I would never want to um, live in a data commons. Um, information that I'd never um, want um, to be monetized. But, um, but you know, there's some set of data that that does and perhaps even should live more robustly in the sense of data commons, as you suggest, and perhaps even to some extent, we already have that. Um, um, in a lot of places, there is, you know, there there is a there is sort of publicly a set of publicly available um, information already, and and that lives um, in a in a public commons um, of sorts. You can think of it that way. But I hear your point that um, if if I understand correctly, one of the challenges it seems is that um, this information is increasingly being siloed um, and held by by you know proprietary entities. Um, when in fact, it seems like there could be a lot of benefit from that information living in a kind of data commons. Um, how we would do that, I think would be tricky. Um, I think that many of these independent, many of these for-profit independent companies would argue that um, they have made their information available for, for, for um, public interest purposes already. But um, I still respect sort of the spirit of your provocation. I think I would need to think about it more to have a better answer, but um, I'd love to be in touch and also hear a little bit more about your um, your vision for this data commons. So also just to make sure I understand it correctly, um, I'll chat you. All right, thanks, I'll leave it at that. All right, thank you very much. Yes, go ahead and chat him. And uh, there are more questions to respond to in the Q&A. I hope uh, all panelists can respond to those. Well, I'd like Linda, Alinda to respond to this. It's a question from Robert Chisache not the first part of the question, the second one, where he asks, how do we address the matter of access to information by the regulators of these digital platforms where such data is stored abroad? So the issue of, uh, you know, more than one jurisdiction we're dealing with here. Thank you, thank you, Gabriel. Um, you see, at, at the end of the day, the, the subject uh, whose data has been um, accessed has a, a domicile under the law. And um, if um, you raise, um, if you are from Uganda, then I believe the right channel to start with is our local jurisprudence. And um, I think Stella guided earlier that the regulations under the, the new regulations that were passed last month have a very elaborate um, process that you can initiate right from your own level and it still holds accountable all these other, uh, shall we call them, big players in the digital space. So as long as it is um, Ugandan data, um, I would encourage everyone to start with the entity that protects us. And then they usually will have linkages and different relationships on how to reach some of these people that would otherwise seem out of our reach. All right. But Stella could probably also supplement. All right, thank you. I'm actually going to Stella. And uh, if Stella is able to fit her answer in about five or so minutes, I'll allow for each of us to give a final word of about 20 or 30 seconds. But Stella, over to you, no pressure. <laughs> no problem. Um, I'll respond to Louis. Uh, uh, Louis's uh, question. Um, it's true our tech startups need a lot of support, um, but I would like to inform the participants that uh, yes, Nita did have uh, uh, those discussions with the uh, Minister of Finance uh, a few years back. But then we discovered uh, Minister of Finance, for them to listen to us, they needed certain information, which was not available. We found actually that, yes, uh, in name, the, uh, some of these startups, some of these uh, IT providers were there. But when you'd go and look deeper, 
you'd find that many of them did not have uh, those structures that would enable us get the information that we need. And to improve this sector, NITA started certifying IT uh, service providers. Uh, right now, we now have a database. We know who is there. We know what they are doing. We know what staffing levels they have and the like. And having generated that database, we are now engaging afresh. And we are not only engaging on our tax incentives, we are also engaging on things like funding, uh, by engaging a UDB, by engaging private sector foundation. So it is work in progress. In addition to that, there are a number of, um, uh, because we, we work within a sector, there are a number of initiatives that have also been set up by our ministry. They have the uh, uh, National Innovation Support Program, uh, NISP, that provides actually funding for many of our startup companies. Um, when there's a, an issue to present, they publish, uh, people participate, and they are given funding for their applications and the like. In addition to that, we also provide hosting services. However, most of these are provided to the innovation hubs. We haven't gone down to uh, provide these subsidies uh, individually but we do provide them to the various uh, innovation hubs that we have uh, in the country. And um, uh, we, we also provide uh, subsidized uh, connectivity uh, for these uh, innovation hubs. So it's still work in progress, but a lot has been done um, in the recent years and there's more to be done. I hope that answers uh, Louis's question. Of course, um, we have an open door policy. Uh, Louis can come or Louis can come and we have you know, more discussions about uh, these issues. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. I should have uh, had you respond to this poll question at the beginning of the webinar, but unfortunately at that time, the technology was malfunctioning. So we're just going to do two poll questions. Uh, please respond to these questions as they appear on your screen. They are yes or no answers, just to give us an understanding of uh, where we as the participants are at in relation to this subject matter. So uh, if I may request the technical team, a poll question. Okay, please respond to that poll question. The questions are two, have you ever read any privacy policy of any service provider? It's yes or no. And then the second one is, do you consider websites recording your internet activity without your knowledge to be a violation of privacy? So also we've limited, limited it to a yes or no. And when you're done, please click submit. As we do that, I'd like to come to each of our panelists for a final word, because again, I don't want to go beyond the time I had requested. I'd asked for 15 minutes after uh, the time when we should have stopped. So I will start with Alex. The final word, Alex. Okay, it's always hard to be the, the first one <laughs> at the end. I'm just worried about um, the way you are arranged on my screen, so you yeah, come Yeah, no, no worries, it's fine. <laughs> No, I mean, I just, um, I think the discussion today um, identified some of the areas where there still needs to be um, more follow up, both by regulators, but also, you know, those that are processing um, personal data and within, you know, industry, but also we didn't talk as much around the public actors as well, like government bodies and um, other uh, public entities. Um, so I think, yeah, in terms of the next steps and, and reflection, I think there's a lot of work to be done still in terms of enforcement and, and accountability and using the law. I think that's key given that in, Ken in Uganda, sorry, it's only been a couple of years is to keep testing it and using the rights that are there for data subjects and also um, some of the opportunities for the regulator uh, to investigate as well as others to submit complaints. I think we need to be utilizing those mechanisms um, to 
um, initiate more discussion and to start documenting what's working, what's not working, what are the good lessons learned and the best practices emerging and which areas require um, not necessarily new legislation, but you know, clarifying and working on more uh, specific standards or um, con codes of conducts that might be required across um, different sectors. Um, so yeah, use the law. Uh, let's make the most of what we already have uh, within it in terms of the safeguards and accountability and enforcement mechanisms um, and then from there, see what requires uh, further improvements. All right. Thank you very much. Varun? Thank you. I was also just jotting down notes for these closing remarks. Um, I completely agree with what Alexandrine just said about um, using the law. Um, I think that's something that needs to be done to advance um, consumer protections um, among um, users, voters in Uganda, I think that's something, that's a lever that the that the public has. I also think that, um, I was just thinking more about Lewis's point, he mentioned he was, he's general counsel at a, start, at a local startup. I think um, likewise, if you are a startup, um, do it well, do it right, you know, secure your user's data, build an app or a product that's secure and use it as a differentiator in the space. I think that, um, you know, there are there are a lot of forces at play here, and um, and those companies that um, that navigate this successfully, I think, um, will be in a better market position. So I think um, that's one piece, and I think part of the solution, of course, with all of this, um, which was commented on earlier as well, Linda commented on just this basic investment in digital literacy that needs to happen through whatever mechanism. But um, I think that's something to keep in mind as well. And if all these three comes to these three things come together, um, leveraging the law and um, startups kind of seeing this as a market opportunity to build secure technology. And if we invest in digital literacy for the public, I think um, Uganda will be in a much better position um, with respect to data protection. All right, thank you. Again, I'm just going by the order on my screen. And next is uh, Linda Bonio. And I'm sure you know that next will be the other Linda. <laughs> Okay, there's like a million leaders in this world. Um, so we, we're going to get somewhere and fight it out. Whoever wins will be the only leader. No, there are only two in this world. <laughs> only two. <laughs> okay. Um, my conclusion will be this. I think there's great opportunity within the data protection, you know, ecosystem. There's a lot of opportunity for lawyers to learn quickly, to represent clients and to represent the public as well in public interest litigation. And so I want to encourage the lawyers in the room to engage. I also think there's opportunity to keep our eye on the regional, you know, discussions that are happening, you know, at the African Union level, and then also to look at, you know, um, free trade agreements that are happening. Uh, we have free trade agreements that actually come and negate the data protection law you already have. In. For instance, the Kenya's law uh, on data protection, um, if you read it together with the US free trade agreement, sort of exempts the Americans from our law. And so I think um, for those who are working in the space, we need to keep our eyes on not just the national laws, but also the regional and international laws and free trade agreements that, that affect this. So we need to talk about data protection under Africa free trade agreement, and what that means for data movement within the continent. I think those opportunities really exist. Um, and you know, we, uh, we also just finally talk to startups that you can build for compliance. There are compliance tools that you can build around data protection. And so just don't see it as a government problem, but it's a problem that society can solve and you can innovate around. Um, so that's it. And greetings from Kenya. All right, thank you. Asante Sana. Linda? Yeah, I, I think that, um, the experts have said all that needs to be said. And uh, uh, I think in addition to supporting the compliance levels, we have to, people like you, unwanted uh, witness, have to start thinking about um, some support to different um, uh, small entrepreneurs that want to comply with data protection um, in that, in that, in those efforts, because at the end of the day, once the data breach happens, it's a big exposure to the business, a small business that already has so many uh, other different things that they are trying to survive. So I think that one of the ways that we can really support data protection and privacy is to find ways to support those who want to comply so that it's not uh, an extra burden or an extra area that they must find investment for, 
uh, for example, in our ecosystem as legal innovators, if you want to carry out a data impact assessment, it's astonishing how much it will cost. And yet if there was, uh, for example, people that are experts in these fields that can be availed alongside the different innovation hubs or the different innovation uh, startup opportunities. So that data is inbuilt in um, just like there is usually legal support or accounting support so that we also have data um, compliance support. Right. Thank you, Linda. Stella? Uh, thank you, Gabriel. I think uh, most of the panelists have said it all. Um, the job that we have is enormous. And um, uh, you'll note that we'll uh, co collaborate or partner with uh, the NGO sector, uh, with other players to be able to, first of all, increase awareness about the obligations of data uh, controllers, increase awareness um, within the data subjects, and uh, just make sure that uh, we all comply. Uh, for the comfort of the participants, um, in terms of our development of this law, I had uh, previously developed other laws. This is one of the law that was really supported. So the need is enormous. Uh, we just need to get on with the job. Thank you very much. And I want to thank Unwanted Witness uh, for organizing this webinar and my fellow panelists for sharing their knowledge uh, with us. All right, thank you very much. And I'd like to actually join uh, Stella in that. We'd like to thank all our panelists for sharing knowledge. You have brought quite an amount of uh, you know, uh, knowledge and understanding to this subject. And by no means are we saying that we've covered it all. And that's why I'd like to encourage you that uh, when the link is put out for the next uh, webinar, in this series of webinars, please register and come and attend, uh, even if you're not going to be a panelist, so that uh, you know we can continue to benefit from your knowledge and your practice. As we close, I'd just like to give you the results for our poll. Question, the uh, first question was, have you ever read any privacy policy of any service provider? 80% of us say yes, and we have 20% who say no. Then uh, the second question, do you consider sites recording your internet activity without your knowledge to be a violation of privacy? 95% of us said yes, and 5% said no. Interesting and uh, uh, unwanted witness, please. I wonder how this is going to inform our next webinars because uh, that 20% over there, that 5%, uh, it means there's work uh, quite a bit of work to be done. We have to end it here, not because we're out of what to say, it's because we're out of time, but we will have more webinars in the future. So please make sure you attend those. Apologies for going beyond the time we had said this webinar would be running for. Uh, please blame that on me. Until next time, I'd like to say thank you. Goodbye. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.